I'm sitting here with Mark Nanos. So what are you up to, Mark? How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Yes, I'm uh, right now working on these volumes that we're going to speak talk about volume one. I'm, I've just am in the editing process of actually the uh, pre-typesetting part of the process with the volume th uh, two, which is on Romans. It's actually the third volume that will come out. And uh, work on that every day until I get done, and then it will be Galatians uh, Volume Three, which will be the last one. Hopefully, come out uh, by the end of the summer. Wow! Wow! That, that's awesome. So those volumes, uh, in some ways, are sort of like if we want to get to know Mark Nanos and your work, are these sort of like where you would point people to start that are interested in your work, or what do you see these volumes sort of being in your repertoire of uh, things you produced? That's a really good question. Um, so Mystery of Romans, which is still in print, is over 20 years old now. Yeah. And it was my first book and before my, I did my PhD. And, and um, obviously I've learned a lot of things since. I've changed my mind about some things or developed it more so than changed it. And um, over the years I've done a number of academic papers or published essays in uh, journals collected volumes, conference volumes, things like that, on Romans. Also, the same with Galatians. That book is uh, from 2000, beginning of 2002, so it's also dated, uh, still in print. And actually, uh, I don't know of anything in that that I disagree with, but... Uh, uh, that, that, uh, that's got to feel good, right? It's tried but, and true. Exactly. But there were a lot of parts I didn't do. I, I didn't uh, work on the narrative elements of that, and I have done many... Uh, papers and essays. So I'm collecting those and other pieces I've done. The broader work on Paul, I never published a book that someone could go to and say, what's the analysis view of Paul in a broader fashion? But I've done a lot of essays, including the first essay in the first volume, which is a very long, it's a short book, actually. It could have been a book. Um, and so a number of other essays that are more a broader base. And then I did a couple of uh, exegetical ones that take that broad base and then just go into a passage and sort of briefly show how it works. And the uh, fourth volume, Corinthians and Philippians, I've never written a book about, yeah. but I've done a number of, uh, again, somewhat um, um, long essays on and research. And oftentimes, you, as you know, probably when you research something new, as for an essay, you essentially do all the work you would do for a book, for a monograph. Oh, yeah. You have to figure it out. And for me, since I'm doing something entirely new for the most part, I, um, I really have to – I spend a year or two on an essay. Yeah. So it seemed really appropriate at the time, uh, maybe a little early, but appropriate to bring together all my essays in this series of volumes. And people could – if they just wanted to see what I did on a specific topic – they can do that and not have the whole series. But if they were interested in, in carrying it out, there's, they can just keep getting the other volumes. And so um, now I think this first volume, Reading Paul Within Judaism, will give – it's the one I can recommend to people. You know, what, what is your view? What are you doing? Take a look at that book. It's small. It, the essays uh, – there's some repetition, of course, in the essays – but not, not enormous amount. And there's also some development in those essays over the years. And so you can see that as it emerges. And um, so that I'm really happy about, especially about volume one, that you can get the broader Paul yeah. without going into all the details. But I'm pleased about all of them. I have new work in each one, um, except for volume four. That's why it came out first, actually. That's the only one that I don't have uh, something new that wasn't published. Maybe I did a paper and didn't publish it, which all the others will have. And Romans and Galatians more so. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And Romans and Galatians are, is where you've spent most of your career. And so to have something that augments what you've already done, that's, that's exciting. Yeah. And some essays in um, each – no, none in the Corinthians Philippians volumes, but in each of the others – I've updated at least an essay or some essays to bring you up to my latest choices in uh, terminology, Christ followers instead of Christ believers or Christian as an adjective, which is where I started in Mystery of Romans. 
Well, actually, that was very innovative. In, mm-hmm. in Mystery of Romans, to just use it as an adjective or to try to, I had resistance to that. Yeah. The, and I wanted to use Christian as a small c. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we just weren't ready for it. I even uh, talked, used, talked with them about using proto-Christian. And 20-some years ago, that, that wasn't okay yet. Yeah. yeah. Now it would be, I think, oh, and sure. a follower of Christ Believer has become common. That was not common then. Hmm. It was... It was, uh, there was resistance to that. Wow. Wow. And whenever an editor got a hold of my work in uh, articles, I just fin- uh, finished, as I say, the, the Romans volume. So it has a, an, the first essay ever published, which was in the late 90s, but I wrote it, probably submitted it in 96 or 7. Oh, I had a lot of editing back to using Christian or Gentile or mm-hmm. churches, these kinds of terms. Now the field has moved, and I've moved too to using other language that defamiliarizes and helps think about new perspectives. So this will help the reader see the latest. Yeah. We're on with that. Um, yeah. In each volumes. Yeah. That's no, that's, that's really good. I mean, defamiliarizing language is upsetting in the best possible way for a lot, for a lot of people, you know, um, when I read your Galatians one, I think I mentioned this to you in the past, but when you, you talk about a message of good instead of good news or, whatever, you know, these, these little sort of like things that remind me that um, I'm reading about something that was living and moving and um, wasn't a canonized piece of theology. Uh, this was a on the ground movement of people trying to figure out what it meant to be. Um, Jewish in a different kind of way, perhaps, but Jewish indeed, and uh, what it meant for the nations to be able to join into uh, that community. And so, um, yeah, I, I love that you do that. I think uh, before we started, I I uh, made a comment about how even in the introduction or the the preface uh, of your first volume, you uh, you remind us, hey, we have to defamiliarize. We have to. Um, uh, remember that every term or most terms at least that we use has a whole backstory. And, um, and I think there's so much value to noticing that. So thanks for doing that. That's helpful for those of us who grow up in the church culture and you know, all that kind of stuff. So, well, thank you. But you know, it happens to me too. Yeah. Because there's just familiar terms and there's, there's a, I'm entering into a discourse that's been going on for 2000 years. Yeah. And there are things that I suddenly wake up and realize, holy smokes, I'm still making choices that don't help the reader and don't help myself. Yeah. Think about it in a new, more historically oriented way. Yeah. And uh, because uh, that's the way language works. And as soon as you say convert, I mean, Paul is the quintessential convert. Right. You can do all of the all of the. caveats that you want about that it's not Christianity yet. But the next page, you you call it a Christian evangelical me, you know message to Christian Gentile churches. You've created the whole yeah. a context that you expect him to speak into. And, uh, and so I continually find myself learning about a new thing. Salvation was one of my latest big discoveries. You know, just a couple years ago, um, that I realized that salvation and restoration, all this played into a certain way of thinking yeah. that to me is anachronistic and, and, and misguided for getting at Paul. Yeah, yeah. And when you go look up the text in the Greek and you realize that's actually not the best translation for what they were talking about when they used those Greek words. Right, right, right. That gives you the justification also to change it, mm-hmm. you know? Be familiarized and to make your – it's cumbersome. It's hard work. It's not as pleasant, but it's what history should do for you to make you stop and realize, well, they were different than me. And what was going on was different than what maybe what's happened. And yeah. that's okay. Let's, let's get them right, as right as we can. Yeah. No, that's, that's really helpful. I mean, even to your point about um, the word – salvation uh sozo right uh yeah so so i was reading the uh, the apology uh socrates is you know mm-hmm. gonna be tried and dead by the end of it spoiler alert or whatever but 
the the word comes up only a couple of times, but there it really seems more about uh, preserving his life and preserving him, not necessarily about some sort of uh, post-mortem situation within which he has gained his eternal life or something. Exactly. Right. And that's the kind of thing it seems like you're getting at with a lot of this. Exactly. If, you yeah. go to, if you go to the, the lexicons and um, look up Sozo, it's not used for resuscitation or bringing back to life. Yeah. And even in the Gospels, that's not the choice of the word. Right. Um, when, pe- when someone like Lazarus come back to life, it's not yeah. Sozo. Sozo is used for uh, what a doctor does. They protect you. They mm-hmm. you. They keep you from dying. Yeah. And if you think of it as kept safe mm-hmm. to keep resonance with saved safe, it it um, and you change that to protect. One of the big payoffs for that is when Christians think about Jews who did not believe in Christ in Paul's time and since they tend to think that they're out. And have to get back in, and you have the you have the phrase "just like a Gentile" or "just like everyone else." Yeah, but they're not just like everyone else in Paul's mind, and that's what he's arguing for: is that they're Israelites, and to them belong all these things, regardless of whether they believe in Jesus or not. And if you change it from "saved," which plays into the idea that they're out and have to get in, to "protected" or "kept safe," that is, they're in. But there are forces that are a threat to them, and those forces include you, Christ-following non-Jews, if you're disrespectful of their sensibilities, if you're not righteous, if you're sinners who claim to be the righteous ones, but you don't give up the unrighteous ways. These are a threat to them. And God, in this uh, mysterious process he's trying to explain there in Romans, is protecting Israel, even during this divided, uh, anomalous mysterious period yeah and so it there's a simple word deep familiarizing not using saved not using uh, the word i had used which was uh, restored that played into that paradigm too and i didn't even recognize that i had an that there was um, a better alternative and that that was misrepresenting the actual use of the greek so you go look at the greek over and over you find out it doesn't it defamiliarizes. Yeah. Wow. You're not making this up. It's yeah. it's what you should do as a historian. You should look at how it probably played in its original context. And then you bridge it. You do the, the hermeneutical work uh, to bridge it, to make sense of why we read it or why we care or why we shouldn't care, whatever it might be. Yeah. Yeah, that's no, that's that's a great example. And I, I'm sure I'm sure there's going to be some listeners who are like, whoa, big challenge. But but here's here's the thing. Um, we more and more in our day and age need to be open to challenge, need to be open to um, looking beyond what the box has uh, given us as the absolute. And yeah. um, I, so I appreciate that about scholars who are willing to get their feet dirty as much as you can, walk in the streets of the first century and asking questions about words and context and, and these sorts of things. And uh, I think that really is a good bridge, actually, to talk about some of the things that your your first volume just raised in me to want to talk about out loud and process and I think a lot of our, our listeners will appreciate, um, you know, one of the things that is a foundation for the so-called Paul within Judaism uh, movement, I, I guess you could call it at this point. There's several scholars uh, that would join you and you're all different, right? So, mm-hmm. so we always want Paul within Judaisms. I don't know how you make that plural, but there's, there's multi, just like the new perspectives, you know. Right. Um, and, and so maybe one question before we uh, get too detailed on Paul's own life is to first talk about sort of differentiating um, the good for, from your perspective of the new perspective, because that's one of the things I noticed as I was reading your, your longer first chapter is you have a whole section there where you, you really break it down and, and help us see this is what I appreciate about what the new perspective started but then they make a move that doesn't really complement the thing they started in your perspective, as I understand it. So can you, can you help listeners who maybe aren't as familiar with these two different ways of talking about Paul just kind of 
get their head around, first of all, where it started and where you're trying to sort of take it in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, and of course, anything I say can be, um, there be somebody who say, well, that's not what I'm, what I say. Right. Because when we talk about the new perspective, uh, the people that represent the new perspective, they also are moving targets, learning things, changing things, modifying. Dunn uh, tried to change the way he first explained works of law, Ergon yeah. Nomu, and, uh, and so he would still be criticized for his earlier way when he was trying to modify it, although in many ways his modified way wasn't that different, but still it's moving. And then what he would hold, uphold versus what Tom Wright would uphold or um, Hayes would uphold and so on. There, there, right. there are differences there and anything that I would say. But as a generalization, I would say that the new perspective when I was first really trying to understand it in the late 80s, early 90s, um, on the negative side, it's not that new. It's, it uses the same paradigm as the traditional Christian, uh, Augustinian, Lutheran, Protestant sort of trajectory, which is very Catholic as well, yeah. um, and Orthodox for that matter. Uh, to the degree that you have biblical uh, scholarship that you can study, it's based on an idea that Paul converted and that this is something different than Judaism. That didn't change. And so when what changed primarily that was good and that I appreciated and actually made my project possible was recognizing that some of the car caricatures of Judaism were mistaken, especially the, the, um, what we call the foil of works righteousness and legalism. And when I first discovered uh, reading Paul within Judaism, which I didn't call it that, but in the 70s, I thought that was the biggest obstacle and one of the reasons I didn't pursue graduate school because I just didn't think Christians would listen to all this development about Paul if they already knew that Judaism was the way that the foil represented it. Right. They broke down that foil and showed that it was not works righteousness and legalistic, that it was based on grace, which is, of course, taking the Christian paradigm and now saying we can understand Judaism through it. But that's okay because aspects of that are true to Judaism, and that's the lens, that's the paradigm in which Judaism needs to make sense in a positive way. So that, that's perfectly fine. And I really, I liked that and that gave me a chance to work. But I became more and more upset by uh, two things. One was a recognition which kind of grew on me that th there was an exchange taking place. There was still something wrong in Judaism. It wasn't works righteousness and legalism. What was wrong in Judaism was particularism uh, what uh, Wright calls nationalism, Dunn calls uh, ethnocentrism, um, and most would refer to in some way as particularistic. And the basic idea of that is actually there's a sense of it that's correct, but the way that it's, it's taken and been used is to me very incorrect and, and very harmful in the same way legalism uh, as a foil had been. That is to say, Yes, Israel is particularistic by definition. So too is Christ following by definition, particularistic. Mm -hmm. So if Paul was against particularism, he failed. Hmm. And all those who seem to speak for him as if that's universalistic are not really being uh, self-aware. It's every bit as particularistic. Now it's particularized around Christ. There's something wrong with it if it's particularized around Torah guidance and adapting that for a you know, lifestyle. But there's nothing wrong with it if it's particularized around Christ and guidance and developing a communal lifestyle around it. Hmm. If, if they're both doing the same thing, then there's nothing wrong with particularism. And then you get underneath that and say, so what's wrong with something? Judaism. Huh. Jewish particularism is bad. Christian particularism if we would admit to it, is good. Hmm. So it kind of gets at still the way that ideologies at work here, yeah. creating a foil. And often that foil, if you just get scratch the surface a little bit and start asking some questions, it actually is illogical. Hmm. Work. 
and it shows other prejudices. And so that began, began to that bothered me on the one side. The other side was all the way back to Sanders, who's not in many ways not part of this new perspective. He wasn't really trying to present Paul this way. His Paul was not doing Judaism. He was Christianity. It's a very traditional Paul when he gets to that. But all the way back to him, he made that famous statement, but he articulated in many ways that the, Paul found something inadequate or wrong with Judaism and a Jewish way of life and Jewish identity, for that matter, for himself as a Christ follower or Christian. And so the basic paradigm didn't change. And that's the biggest difference. So what, what I'm doing and what uh, my uh, co-conspirators in this Paul within Judaism kinds of perspectives are doing is that we, our sensibility is different about this. Yeah. To the degree that it's setting up a foil, we question that. What are we doing here? Hmm. What are we privileging? Are we doing history when we do that? Probably not. We're doing ideology. We don't want to do that. Of course, we have to enter the discourse with the people who are doing ideology, and some proudly so, but that's a different task than doing history. Hmm. So if we say, as all the people in the new perspective uh, that I, you know, I think the, the leaders would certainly say, there was no Christianity yet. Right. Paul was not Christian. But then on the next page, they have to use that language. Why don't we get rid of that language? If it was only Judaism or other kinds of polytheistic choices, then why wouldn't they be doing Judaism? Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're doing it as a subgroup. They're doing some things differently. They have to adapt, as does every other Jewish subgroup that has Pharisees as a subgroup or, and so on. And different Pharisaic groups are doing different things. Yeah. And we, have, we respect that as an intra-Jewish development, and we try to make sense of it in Jewish terms, which is not to say it's not Greco-Roman terms. They're, Judaism is a Greco-Roman phenomenon. So that's the big difference. Yeah. If you struggle through that and you don't let yourself use church because of the way it what it connotates, you don't let yourself use Christian, you don't let yourself use Gentile, um, certainly not Gentile churches, because all those connotations that are there, you can make all the caveats you want, but it's hard for your, your own brain. You can see the scholars' own brains, much less the readers, right. to escape the paradigm. And we don't want to play to that paradigm. We want to recognize that paradigm and discuss Paul in um, intelligent ways in the discourse of that paradigm. But we actually think Paul should be discovered as a first century figure, like you would try to discover Philo. People don't have as much trouble with that because they're not looking to his voice to guide them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so they're, they can read Julius Caesar or Cicero or Quintilian. They don't, they don't have to like him or agree with him and internalize him. But Paul is different for many people. And so the Paul in Judaism is to say, hey, if it's Judaism that he's practicing, let's try to understand what that would have meant and what the people's assumptions would have been about what that meant. And one of the great things about this is it pushes you to actually into Paul's language in a way that's, that most doesn't. It pushes you right into this question of circumcision. Yeah which is about ethnocentric, or not, not ethnocentric, ethno-religio uh, identity. Yeah. And that's different than ethno-religio behavior. Hmm. So to, to, before I go back to the Jewish question, just to put it in a, a common thing that anyone could recognize today, there's a thing called becoming a Catholic. Hmm. You go to classes, you become a catechumen, and there's a ritual, a rite, a rites of passage, what's called ergonomu in Greek, I believe, in Paul's hmm. case. There's a rite of passage, a rites of passage that culminate this process, after which you're a Catholic and you're entitled to the sacraments, for example. Whether you behave like a Catholic thereafter, there's actually sacraments to deal with that. Even if you don't do those sacraments, you are an uncontested Catholic for the most part. Now, on this, at the same time, you could have a person who acted more Catholic than that convert all their life or for a great deal of their life. They're never entitled to the sacraments. Hmm. They're not a Catholic. And it may not be salient every day. They may go to mass and, and kneel and stand and all of that. 
but it's salient when it comes to their children being baptized or or having a wedding or getting forgiveness or uh, last rites, all those sacraments. That Catholic who's been a terrible Catholic is still entitled to last rites, I think, yeah. or at least some the process. I don't know the details, but hopefully the point stands. Yes. If we go back, what happens in Christian theology, let's take Galatians, which I've worked on so much. People think it's a freedom from the Torah. The, the whole book, the whole letter was not about Torah. The letter's about circumcision. That's not Torah. To a non-Jew male, that's about initiation, a change of identity to becoming a Jew. The rites of passage at the end of a, of a decision about um, joining a community as a full member, like a Catholic. So you could act more Jewish than all the Jews in that community as a Christ-following non-Jew. That wouldn't make you a Jew. And the Jew in that community could act less Jewish than many non-Jews. That wouldn't make them not a Jew. Hmm. We're talking about circumcision and ergon nomu, as I read it, the works of law as it's usually translated, as the rites of passage. Yeah. So ethno-religious identity and ethno-religious behavioral patterns, while you can't divide them entirely, I mean, we can, yeah. they overlap, of course, yeah. but you can divide them to have this conversation because Paul is having a conversation with the Galatians or actually a, a heated a, a instructional conversation, like with a teenager that he fears is getting away. Um, about this distinction, not about observing Torah. Yeah. And so if you, if you, this is the kind of thing it helps you see. If you try to think of this in terms of Judaism, what's happening if Paul is telling non-Jews that the Messiah of Israel is the, is the, is the savior of the nations to worship the one God as members of the other nations who do not become Israelites, who do not become part of Israel, who are not grafted into Israel. They're grafted into the tree of the family or people of God alongside Israelites. And therefore they have to, they're being converted into Judaism, into a way of life that Jews live without being converted into ethno religio identity of a Jew. Imagine a Catholic priest who went out rogue, which Paul would look like, right? And telling non-Catholics, oh, if you do all the Catholic stuff, you're better than a Catholic. <laughs> you know, yeah. doesn't do all the stuff. Yeah. And do you think that rumors and other things would start to mess us up and, and, and lose the distinction between Catholic and not Catholic, but who acts Catholic? Now, you, if you just can, if you, if I'm making any sense, yeah. You can imagine that he's bringing them into Judaism, to a Jewish way of life, into no longer sinners but righteous, as he puts it in Romans 6. And, and he's teaching them this way of life, and it's confusing because other Catholics, or Jews in our case, don't accept the propositional logic. They say, hey, we have a way to become a Catholic. We have a way to become a Jew. If that's what you want, that's what you're required. This other guy, this other guy's wrong. That's not the way it works. Way it works. And this other guy, and this Paul, other guy, Paul, in our case, in our case uh, would say, uh, would say. But that the end of the ages has come. That changes the game. That's the time when those from the other nations would practice a Jewish way of life without being Jews, because that Jewish way of life is developed around God's guidelines of Torah for Israel, and we have to adapt it because they're not Israel. So there's new things we have to figure out, but it's not a new paradigm. It's not a new game. It's just the realization of that moment that's arrived. I know this is a long answer, but, but this, this is what's different about the practice of the new perspective, which gets you into thinking about Christianity as something separate from Judaism with some changes to the way you talk about Judaism, but underneath it, not really that much. There's still a foil. It's still the other that you've left. And Jewish identity, you can see right, done, and so on. I, I have them in footnotes where they say Jewish identity for Paul doesn't matter to him anymore. What matters is Christ's identity. Well, that's a false binary. If you think of it within Judaism, that's not a real question. Am I, because I became a father, am I no longer a son or a husband? I mean, that's a false binary. They've added a new identity. But it doesn't make the other one obsolete in any way or less important. The salience might change in a given moment where I'm a father rather than a son. 
And you could even have a conflict where that becomes the salient point of uh, division. But in general, we carry these different things. And they were Jews who believed in Christ and non-Jews who believed in this in this figure who were entering a Jewish way of life. Within Judaism, it forces you to work these out. Within the new perspective, it doesn't. Yeah. It yeah. In the traditional ways, making, uh, well, as Wittgenstein might put it, moving a few rocks around on the surface, but not the riverbed itself isn't changed. It still runs the same way. That's, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I, wonder like so so this is just raising all kinds of things in a good way um because as you say i mean this is a a big distinction and i was in conversation with someone about this last night about new perspective paul within judaism one of the one shared common grounds i hear is um it's really a new perspective on judaism and and then saying how can we carry out how we read paul consistent with this so-called new perspective on Judaism. And what you seem to be saying in a lot of ways is um, we we get it wrong if we suppose that Paul has relativized his commitment to Torah, has relativized his commitment to his um, way of life and identity as well, um, which the proponents of kind of the new perspective as it's popularly understood would advocate. Um, you're saying, no, no, no. Uh, they remain, and, and I want to read a quote, actually. Uh, this is from page 40. I, I photocopied it, so it's very, uh, <laughs> I didn't have to thumb through a book and get too much uh, mess here. But um, let, me, let me read this really quick, because I'd love to hear you talk about on the ground what this looks like in practice. Because I think a lot of people are like, okay, so um, does Paul within Judaism mean that, you know, Kurt Willems, who comes from a Mennonite heritage and, uh, you know, is a follower of Jesus, takes what Paul says as authoritative for the way I live today, obviously with the hermeneutical gap that we have to bridge and, you know, a lot of history and all of that. Uh, does that mean that I should always be eating kosher, that I should, um, you know, follow Torah in certain ways, except for circumcision? Like, like what is this really getting at? And I think, this quote helps start that answer. And maybe you can give more to that. But you say, um, let me see here. This is on page 40. And you say, Paul can write of equality of Jew and non-Jew in Christ and of keeping the commandments of God as paramount without negating any of Torah. Within this new community, or within this community, the ethnic or national difference between Jew slash Israelite and non-Jew slash member of the nations, and therefore their different relationships to Torah remain, but the present age discrimination inherently uh, can concomitant with such distinctions should not. For Paul, it is fundamental to the truth of the gospel that difference remains, that social boundaries are acknowledged, but that discrimination should not in this age as in the age to come. That is potent stuff. I mean, really potent stuff because what does that look like? Do, do they eat meals together? You know, this is something that I, I know N.T. Wright brings up is so important that they can eat together. Um, and, and some of the probably common practices of the time would make that pretty hard, I would assume. But perhaps uh, you can shed light on what does it look like for them to be part of the same family, but be distinct and not, you know, it's kind of like when we talk about race today, I think the whole like, we should be colorblind. Um, you're saying, no, absolutely not. There is no colorblindness here. We're naming that we're different, but we're also together. And, and so help us understand some of that, Mark. This is really important stuff. Well, thank you. This, this is actually one of the exciting things for me in terms of its potency for theological thinking. Um, and, but I, 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 uh, I feel like I have to be careful here because Christians need to do that theological thinking. I'm trying to point the way to the, the 
the kind of Paul that I discover here and the potential I think he has. And it does have a lot. And, and also you should be careful because it does have re this resonance for us today. You should ask yourself, well, are you doing history here? Mm -hmm. Or are you imposing this on Paul? And we always will have this circular thing. The thing is to be humble and keep questioning yourself yeah. and, and trying to make sure this is the best history you can do. But the reason that I do it is because I think there's promise in it. Even if I saw it as history that I didn't think had promise, like lots of other historical things I'm curious about, I, I mean, I would love to have been a classical scholar and studied other people and stuff, but I don't think they matter as much. This guy's voice still matters in a way that the historical thing I, I see matters. And one of the potentials is speaking into gender, race, socioeconomic differences, now nationalist, nationalist boundaries. I mean, in America, we have this crisis because of government uh, uh, discussions about people from other places that are preferred versus those who aren't. Yeah. Yeah. All these kinds of discriminations on the basis of difference. The um, biblical model I think Paul is drawing from as he sorts this out and tries to make sense of it is the Isaiah's model at the end of the, of the book of Isaiah where you have this imagery, it's also earlier, but this imagery of a wolf and a lamb eating together. You know, the picnic is taking mm -hmm. place, so to speak, with all the animals. And normally that would be a bad day to be a lamb at the picnic. Yes. <laughs> and the idea is that uh, in, in this vision that, uh, well, at least one of the visions Isaiah has, so they're so messy and there's so many, you can pick and choose. Well, Paul is pick and choosing here. The image of, of uh, a time to come when all of the nations that are normally a threat to the lamb, Israel, can eat together hmm. and not be eating each other. And that gets at this difference without discrimination, the eating each other, this, this, this kind of language Paul uses in Galatians 5 in the same sort of way. If you fight for your status against each other, it's like dogs fighting for uh, who's the alpha dog. It's not the way it should work. In the age to come should be a time of shalom in which you're different, but you're equal in the sense of, uh, of being you know, the equal doesn't mean you do everything the same or like the same food. I don't expect the lamb and the wolf like the same food in the age to come to push the metaphor too far, but it's not the lamb that the wolf eats. So uh, I think Paul's drawing on that. And I think that has a lot of potential, as you say, for seeing the color, letting the color be there, not trying to, as our discourse today is a whiteness problem. You're not trying to uh, bring it all together it always has to come together to some kind of norm, but changing what that norm is. In fact, I think that's one of the pushback areas. That norm is Jew and Jewish, mm -hmm. which may grate and may stick in the teeth a little mm -hmm. for Christians because that's been the negative foil. Now it's the positive foil. And I've argued, in, as you, I think it's in that first volume, that, that Paul is using them at the end of Romans 2 in a way that I don't think anyone's ever seen, that the Jew is the model yeah. to which to blend, but, but not by becoming a Jew. And that creates this problem. So Paul's um, vision here, which is perfectly prophetic tradition of Israel, is um, not the only one, but the one he's trying to make sense of what the Jesus event means, has a lot of uh, potential. It's a utopian notion. It also doesn't work very well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're 100% on that. Just like the American experiment. Yeah. And a lot of times it looks like hypocrisy, and a lot of times it is. But but the prophet points to that and says, but this is the way that it's supposed to be. We should change that. We should legislate that. We should fix that. Not, and not, uh, not uh, paper it over and not admit to it and not amalgamate it as it has been to the, to the white male and make the, everyone else fit that. We need to see the problem, but also see the realities. It's not easy. And this, this experiment, if you will, allow that, I don't mean it in a derogatory way, that Paul is trying to work out in community. He's, he's, his letters are responses to the problems that it doesn't work that well. In Galatia, they say, listen, 
why don't we just do what every other Jew says we should do and be Jews? We're happy to do that, and then we get rid of this problem. In Rome, I think they're said, they've said, no, we don't do that. We get it. But we don't like the resentment, the, the non-acceptance, so we'll just go our own way, which is, of course, the direction it really took in the end. Right. Every, everywhere. And so when you have difference— you have discrimination. That's just that's the nature of the world, and to, and the utopian experiment to to not do that it, it breaks down. I mean, in the, the U.S., there's been all kinds of utopian communities that came out of Europe, uh, usually, and they make it for a year, five years, ten years, fifty years, even. They get messy. It's difficult. Yeah. In this experiment, it started to break down pretty early too, because people are people. And the non-Jews, if they're not getting full, um, well, social identity theory uh, shows this in many many ways, the simplicity of it. If they don't get equal esteem by not becoming Jews and equal acceptance in the broader community, and they don't get some of the other rights and goods that go with that, like understanding that they don't have to do family and civic cult, just like Jews don't have to. Paul's creating this rock and hard place they have to live in. So there's several ways to negotiate that. And one of the ways is to reject the Jews hmm. and reject the Jewish community and create your own, in which you're on top and the Jews are on the bottom. And that's what happened. Um, and that's completely logical that that would happen because humans need the esteem. They need to be whatever that thing is that's the top, that it yeah. melts towards, so to speak. And so um, it's a difficult experiment, and it always will be. But it's a tension I think Christians should hold themselves to, likewise Jews. Wow. Although Jews don't uh, uh, agree about the propositional ideal that the end of the ages has come, they don't disagree about the ideal. Wow. And so for Jews uh, in the Jewish communities, it's tended to be by um, uh, caring for the less uh, fortunate, by lots of uh, various charitable organizations and hospitals and things like that. In present age terms, how do we, how do we express this loving kindness that should be what all of life is? And Jews resolve that way. Christians really do the same kinds of ways to resolve that. But their ideal should be, the Pauline ideal at least should be, that the end of the ages has arrived and therefore we're obligated to live this way. Yes. So pacifists, for example, that should be part of the rationale. Mm -hmm. It's not about being victorious. It's about being faithful to that which we claim. Right, right. And so it has all of this kinds of very exciting, uh, and I hope that it will be developed by some Christian theologians and thinkers, the kinds of potentials that this has. And as I say, uh, I say it warily as somewhat as an outsider, but also because I'm an American in the 21st century, a multiculturalist, a post-modern <laughs> type of, uh, I, I, there's many good things about that, listening to the minority voice, being uh, respectful uh, of people who have a totally different way of being and thinking, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So when I find this in Paul, although he's not my man, I still have to, you know, I, I need to be humble. Uh, is that really in Paul? Or am I imposing that in Paul? Right. I think it's really there. I would not be doing this project if I didn't think it's really there. Yeah. I don't think he's perfect. I don't think he's perfect. I don't think he exemplifies it. But I think that's the ideal to which he's calling himself and others to the degree that he recognizes it. Yes. Yes. I mean, and that, that you call it, uh, what do you call it? Chrono, uh, chronometrically appropriate, right? Yeah. Right. That, I mean, it's, uh, it's the old question that many theologians, uh, some theologians ask, what time is it, right? When, when Paul is talking, you kind of bring up some of that language. And, and for him, the end of the ages has arrived with Messiah. And right. what that means is the, the nations are brought in under the law of Christ. And those Jews who believe in Messiah are Torah observant and uh, law of Christ observant, so to put it, um, right. both united in the spirit of Christ, both kind of, and that, that would be the most uh, shared element, I would assume, uh, how they would understand it on the ground, is that we share in the spirit of Christ and the law of Christ, and we practice our identities differently, and we can honor those identities. So probably, 
I would, I'm just trying to tease this out a little bit and help me, help me if I'm wrong, Mark. Um, would you imagine a first century meal time if this happens to be mixed company, which um, sometimes it is, and I assume sometimes it's not, um, where people from the nations, using language that's not Gentile there, right? Um, people from the nations uh, are sitting at a table with their Jewish messianic uh, sisters and brothers um, say to themselves, in this setting, we are going to be kosher because we are going to honor um, their Torah obedience, even though we are not bound by the same obedience. Is that is that kind of how you might imagine something like that happening? Yeah, we could talk about this for a long time. And yeah. my Galatians book is going to have several um, recently published or new essays about the Antioch incident because there we have a meal gathering. And um, um, soon to come out will be one that I've part of the title is a subversive banquet narrative. Hmm. And I get into Greco-Roman uh, banquet behavior, which was also practiced in Jewish communities to the degree that we understand it. The basic thinking is, this age thinking, is that you have a, a highly um, hierarchical uh, table setting. That's normal. And we still have it in some ways. At a, at, a, at a wedding, there's a head table and assigned seating and so on. And it can be, um, I mean, if you have some big dignitary coming that isn't part of the family, they're probably going to still be treated in a special way in terms of your arrangement. But in general, we tend to, you know, kids come into a classroom, they take whatever seat they want. That's not the way it was. Hmm. The front row is reserved for the senator's kids. You know, the second row, the slave's kids, you know, if they got to come in, they stood up in the back, so to speak. Everything was hierarchical. Food uh, uh, um, is a great place for that. And it's not just the seating arrangement. It was which cut of meat you got, how much water was with your wine. It was very, it was understood. That's just the way it is. And um, if you have a group that believes the end of the ages has arrived so that you're different, some are still senator's kids and some are still slave kids, but there's not to be discrimination at this table. It takes on a, a visible representation of the wolf and the lamb. Wow. So what I think is happening in Antioch, and the reason that the problem comes up and that it's about circumcision, it's not about diet. It's not the dietary committee that Peter fears. Because it's a Jewish group, of course it's already eating Jewishly. If you enter a Catholic group without becoming a Catholic, what do you expect? It's a Catholic banquet that you enter. This is a Jewish banquet. Of course they're doing it in a Jewish way. That's not the problem. The problem is that a normal Jewish way includes the normal hierarchical way. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, and in Paul's economy, everything is flat. Right. Yeah. So now the proselyte is not distinguished from the righteous Gentile. Oh, man. This, right? This it's about some legs. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so then you have this um, dynamic in which you can make sense of Peter. Peter's just, he's not, he's not teaching something other than Paul. He's just saying, why don't we meet at separate tables for a little bit? Because we're getting some flack from the locals that we, we don't want this to blow up on us. So we just withdraw for this meal. And Paul says, ah, that would betray this as liars. We have to uphold the truth of the gospel that the end of the ages has arrived. We have to demonstrate this or we're nothing. Wow. This is the kind of Judaism we practice. And so the Jews, one of the things this does, it makes it clear that Jews believing in Jesus has nothing to do with the practice of Torah being abandoned or trivialized or a problem. The problem is figuring out how non-Jews can practice a Torah-ish life without being legally under Torah because they don't become Jews. But they're entering a Jewish community. It's just like normal. Yeah. Lightness if you're a guest somewhere, but in the long term, you can't just be a guest. That's the problem. You're a member. How does that work? The other groups don't think you're a member, blah, blah, blah. So there's a perfect kind of, I think, the Antioch incident, if we read it within Judaism, not imagining that it's leaving Judaism, yes. not saying that Paul and James are on two different ends of a spectrum about whether Torah should be applied, and not all that stuff. Just imagine it's a Torah-observing group that is changing the seating, changing the serving, 
And that is um, one of the things about banqueting and, and feasting in antiquity is it's somewhat public. It's recognizable. So that would be public to the other Jewish groups in town. And you can say all you want about there's a Messiah, we believe this Messiah, whatever, big deal. Like Christians could have some different views on things, although that's not the best example because for sure he tends to want uh, conformity on ideas. But in Judaism, you could have a different idea. But when you start to demonstrate social practice, wow. for example, in a Christian group, you can talk all you want to about helping the poor. But if you get people that start to drag true poor people in and sit them down on the front row of your church, yes, people with bags full of all their stuff who don't know the proper language and politeness and order of things, you're going to get a reaction. Oh, man. Right. So oh. when you change social policy, you change this thing and you justify it by the fact that these guy, this guy, the Romans killed is alive. And that's the beginning of the end of the ages that we uphold as our utopian communal uh, way of life. It's not in any way a conflict with Judaism. It's a Jewish ideal. What the other Jews pushback is going to be. Show me the money, as they say in Missouri. Wow. Where, where is where is the empirical evidence that it's changed? And Paul's view is the empirical evidence is right here. Yeah. Would we behave that way? How could that happen unless the spirit of God's at work among us? And the other Jews would say, yeah, but what else? I mean, the Romans still rule. We're still this. We're still that. And as soon as that little group behaves in a way that undermines the propositional claims, it's there too. Wow. That's why Paul confronts Peter. He sees the principle underneath it. Hmm. He sees that this temporary, perfectly reasonable diplomatic withdrawal for a short time, he understands that. But he sees that we betrayed these non-Jews who were willing to become Jews because they can't gather at our table. Now we've betrayed the, hmm. the proposition. We cannot do that. Wow. That's what he's saying. And all the rest of Galatians 2, by the way, the, the people think what he said to Peter and then the other part, that's part of normal narratives about banquets. They move back and forth between because they're teaching moments. And his rest of his teaching moment is, hey, listen, we who are Jews, who have the works of law, i.e. we have the rights as children, we've become Jews, we still believe in Christ. And therefore, we're equal with these people who believe in Christ who are not Jews. And you can't betray that. That's what the whole argument says. That I, I mean, you're you're breaking this down in such a helpful way because it's no longer just about um, kind of ideas, but but this is really a social conflict. It's a power dynamic conflict. It's a how do we um, look to those who aren't part of our immediate subgroup of Jewish, uh, follow, you know, Jew, Jewish yep. folks. And yeah, that's, that's profound. As an Anabaptist, and as Anabaptist, this is right at the heart of things that you guys struggle with. Yeah, absolutely. You take a certain propositional truth and you say, we can't, yeah, it doesn't make sense to you. Yeah. It's not the most strategic, <laughs> yeah. uh, tactical, but it's a proposition that we uphold. Yeah. And we pay the price for it. That's right. It's never going to sell big. It's not going to. You can't run the government like that, a secular government like that. You don't win. It's yeah. not it's not reasonable. Right. It's a propositional claim about way way you should be. And so you should resonate with it very much. I would expect you to. But some others are going to be put off by this. Yeah. Uh, because, because I not, mean, to take your example, I'm what? Oh, this is so helpful because I mean, even your example of an Anabaptist and you're, you know, you're referring to our nonviolence and that stuff. I mean, uh, I get so many, if that comes up anytime from an outsider and, you know, an outsider, meaning a Christian who's not an Anabaptist, mm -hmm. um, it's what about dot, dot, dot. So it's what about Hitler? What about your spouse and your child? Right. And they go to these worst case scenarios to create a paradigm rather than saying, what is really happening on the ground with our ethic and letting it butt yeah. up from there. And I can imagine these, these Jewish communities seeing this thing going on and saying, but what about our structure? 
What yeah. about our distinctives? What about, you know, and all of the what abouts that our starting place is so often when we're caught off guard by newness and um, chronometric realities that are different. Um, yeah, absolutely. Th thank you for that. I think yeah. a lot of folks will resonate. Yeah. And I think if I may push the Anabaptist one, uh, and um, if you had an Anabaptist leader and you had a draft, and Anabaptist children did not have to be drafted. And you had an Anabaptist leader, as you know, it can be somewhat uh, somewhat similar in the sense that they're somewhat independent. I mean, there's a, a core, but you know, you get to get a guy who goes off and he says, if you come to my Anabaptist congregation on Sundays, you don't need to register for the draft. Think about it. Oh yeah. Ideal of Jesus, no sword. You're a Christian young men. Come to my meetings. Don't go to the draft board. Think about the pushback. It's not just about identity formation. Pushback from that kid's parents, from that kid's local community leaders and, and friends, unpatriotic, unreasonable. The pushback from other Anabaptists towards this rogue teaching, because you have to police that boundary, not because you're nasty, but because your own children's privilege will be lost if you don't govern it. Wow. Right? Yep. That's what's going on when you mess with this kind of a, what you can call ethnocentric exclusivism, but it's really, you could be included. You could be an Anabaptist, but that's different than acting like an Anabaptist. Yeah. And where the law is concerned, that difference is important. It's poignant hmm. and it's salient. And you mustn't cross that boundary. You must keep it clear. And that's what Paul's messing with because of his chronometric is, is, a uh, conviction, chronometrical, that the end of the ages has arrived, it changes the game. It doesn't change it from being Judaism. It doesn't change it from being Anabaptist. It doesn't change it from being Catholic. It changes what you're going to do with the other, how you're going to integrate them, if it's the end of the ages and all the nations are to worship the one God. So all those other analogies don't work as well. Right. And the claim isn't the same. But the rogueness works. Yeah. You can see the, 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 the threat that that is. And the local, this is one thing that's really missed in Christian theologizing about Jewish reaction to this. It's policing your boundary for the protection of your own and the person, the other. Wow. This non-Amish boy, you're serving his interest to make this clear too. Hmm. You either are Amish or you're not Amish. You're welcome to come to these meetings, but when you go home, you register for the draft. They would be telling these Gentile Christ followers you're welcome here. We have lots of other non-Jews who worship God for a variety of reasons and come and meet with us. Here's, you can conform uh, to our basic cultural uh, style. You can eat uh, what we eat and so on. But when you go home, you're not Jews. And therefore, the, the civic society, the Roman society, expects you to honor Caesar in a way we don't have to. It expects you to honor your ancestors and have family cult. And if you try to excuse yourself from that on the basis that you're like Jews without having become Jews, you threaten us too. And you threaten yourself and your family. And those people think that the gods are going to be mad if you don't do these practices. And the governors and leaders are going to be mad and you're going to suffer and pay a price. So there's a lot at stake here that's not just simply um, the way it's often categorized. Is it? Absolutely. You know, and because what you're getting at is so important because Paul says that they're to forsake idols. He's saying you, you non-Jewish folks forsake idols. Idols yeah. are out. And yeah. that does mean all of these implications because yeah. uh, some listeners may not know this, but Jewish folks, it's well documented in the first century, had an exemption to where they didn't have to participate in the imperial cultic activity. Um, right. But they had to, I, I believe it was annually, they would do a temple um, kind of offering and prayer on behalf or for the emperor, but not right. necessarily to any of those gods. And, and so here you have these, um, they're in, but they haven't become Jewish. Right. Um, and then they go home and right. they're saying, I can't participate in all of this. And absolutely. If you have these mixing of categories, of course you would have yeah. the question, are the local authorities going to come after us for 
as you said, going rogue. It, it does. Wow. I, I mean, I think, I think this will be new for a lot of listeners, but I think it's a, it's a reconstruction that seems very plausible. I mean, this, this kind of on the ground reality, if we, if we can't imagine ourselves on the ground, when we're reading ancient letters about real people in real places, we have some homework to do. And it sounds like Mark, you were doing some of that heavy lifting for us and definitely appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, as we kind of transition here, uh, this is a great, uh, I could go two more hours. I know you could too. <laughs> um, but I know the average commute time to and from work probably is about an hour. So we'll give them an hour or so, but, uh, <laughs> you know, Mark, I, I'm thinking here a little bit. I, I just love what you're doing in your first volume. I think folks should go out and get the book. It's called Reading Paul Within Judaism. Uh, and it's volume one of the collected essays of Mark D. Nanos. And uh, just really appreciate what you're doing. I um, wonder, you know, as we kind of move towards the close, what are you, I know you're working on finalizing a couple of these volumes. What is the most exciting thing that you're working on right now? Maybe you already told us a little bit ago, but what what is the thing that um, maybe it's not even sorted out yet? And, you know, um, no one's going to judge you for that because no one's got it all sorted out. But but is there something or a couple of things that you're working on that you're like, oh, as this comes together, it gives me um, headaches at night, but man, they're worth it because this is, this is important stuff. Like, yeah, that's an open-ended kind of take us towards our resolution here, Mark. What, what do you, th what are you thinking about feeling out and all of that? Well, it's exciting time for me because as you get your legs with this, as you get on with, uh, what I'm basically doing is taking the flashpoints in the traditional construction of Paul and Judaism, or Paul against Judaism, or Paul post-Judaism. So those are the texts, and of course Romans and Galatians are the two books that are most often as a complete letters, but there's flashpoints in all these various texts that are the pri primary ones. And um, every time I start on a new one, I don't know for sure what's going to happen. One of the most exciting parts of it is just the postulating of what the readers, original readers probably assumed about Paul and what their situation was that he was reacting to. That is always so interesting aside, even if it doesn't go to the Paul in Judaism or Paul within Judaism kind of conflict, that's always there as I read it because they're inter Judaism. And so even if it's something that you wouldn't think of as a Paul and Judaism flashpoint, these get really exciting for me just by changing the assumption. So if you just assume they know Paul observes Torah, you're starting with an assumption that almost no interpreters of Paul have ever shared, written ones that we know about anyway. Right, so right. Um, then if that's the case, except Luke or the writer of Acts. Right. See, know that um <laughs> we ignore all of that i mean you know paul was being practical when he did that thing at the temple towards the end yeah. of acts come on right. it can't yeah. possibly be that he actually observes this stuff you know right yeah. what, if, what if that guy what if that writer actually was onto it but um which is which is ironic of course but so um I am worked uh, a lot on the allegory in galatians 4 and reading it within a Jewish liturgical cycle. It's very interesting. And I hope to finish that. I mentioned to you this uh, Sozo thing. I gave a paper a couple, two and a half years ago now, uh, Society of Biblical Literature. I hope to do a small book around that. Um, I have an introduction to Galatians I'm trying to finish for a series. Wow. <clears throat> and then a commentary on Romans that I'm trying to write that many of these essays, especially the ones in the Romans volume that uh, will come out here in a, in a couple, three months, um, so probably by June or, or so of, uh, 2018 and, um, each of these are helping me work through the commentary, which essentially I want to do it, a working translation and paraphrasing and inner texts that help a reader try to sit in a synagogue yeah. subgroup in Rome in say 55 and try to understand, um, what Paul was trying to say. Wow. And, 
I, uh, so I'm not going to interact so much with all the other literature, later Christian, whatever. I, I mean, of course, I'm informed by that, and I'll study that. But I really want to try to help a reader just sit and read Paul within Judaism. Wow. And here's, here's a really exciting thing about that. We don't have commentaries from the within Judaism perspective, for the most part at all. No, uh, no. You know, people always say, hey, what, uh, what commentary should I read on Romans or Galatians that gives some of these interesting insights? And I'm like, uh, maybe I'll write one someday. I have no idea. No. <laughs> you know so what I mean? Like, it's probably going to be the next generation of those yeah. who do it. Uh, we don't even have an introduction to Paul. No. Uh, uh, Anders Runison and I have proposed to do one, uh, and we, d we, we just don't seem to get it done. But um, there just isn't much. And that's one reason I'm excited about this series of volumes, because I think now um, you can offer something specific, not just a book that's an in-depth monograph thing, but uh, uh, um, shorter works that explore different aspects of this um, paradigm. And, uh, and you'll have that. Uh, soon. You have parts now and you'll have it soon. By the end of this year, you'll have four volumes of containing, you know, quite a few essays that show you how to do this. But I think it'll still be a while before I can do it. And uh, my colleagues who are participating in this uh, paradigm uh, change, it's really hard work and long, it takes a long time when you can't just hatch together stuff that other people have worked out and put a little spin here or there. You actually have to do completely new research on every element and keep changing your mind as the other elements. It, it just, it takes a long time to start over. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's really exciting. There, you know, it's, it's exciting work because it's new. Yes. Yes. No, I, uh, I think it's very exciting. I think, uh, listeners to this, this podcast, you know, whether or not you, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm vibing all the way with Mark or I have some reservations or whatever you might find yourself feeling or thinking as you listen. Um, when we push boundaries and ask hard questions, even if we don't change our complete paradigm, it's, it's beautiful that we can start saying, whoa, but even though I don't fully adopt this yet, this, this nuance is actually helping me see Paul differently or see the new Testament or see this thing differently. And, and then some of you are like, no, this is the view I've been waiting for. And so please write these commentaries. And I, you know, I think, I think there's just, it's exciting when there's movement in a direction that is, um, asking new questions. And, uh, for some of us, these are questions we never knew to ask, but are thankful are being asked. So thank you for that, Mark. Yeah, thank you. And I, I would say, you know, one thing I tried to articulate in the preface to this first volume is I recognize some people immediately will react negatively to this, just as some will welcome it and be excited. And um, you should ask yourself why. Yeah. Because if you're seeking to understand this and you want authenticity, as one person put it to me, if you want to get it right, then something new or something that pushes against what you assumed shouldn't be shut down. It should be explored. You should be welcome. It's actually, hey, I get to think about something new and interact with it, but also something that might be right. Yeah. What if what if it is, or more right or or correct something that I've gotten wrong? And um and that's part of the challenge. Just as you should expect me to question it and to question myself why I do it why I see it that way, you should question yourself why you don't. What's your ideology here? What do you think is as obvious as error? Rather than, and, and you can tell that reaction if your first reaction is, yeah, but what, what, what about this? Yeah, but what about this? What about this? There's nothing wrong with that per se. It means you have a paradigm, but you should be aware. Right. Let me talk about this thing I'm talking about right now. Then we'll move to the next one. That's right. What if this, we assume different set of things and we see where it goes. And then, then we say, and that's exactly why I say I have these flashpoints. Then we'll go to the next one, Romans 14. And then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 8. We'll do all of those. This takes years and years now of, of work at it, but I've done lots of them and there's still a few to go. Yeah. And why don't we, why not be excited about that search? Why not engage it with an anticipation that you'll learn something, even if, you bristle at it. You should ask yourself, why? Yeah. Why do I bristle at it? 
What is threatened here? Hmm. I'm not saying that Paul didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. Yeah. Right. I'm not saying his communities didn't follow Christ and believe the end of the ages had arrived and the resurrected Christ. I'm not saying that. The, I'm not taking that away from you. Yeah. yeah. I'm asking you to try to understand what it probably meant to them before you decide what it means to you. That's oh. and then to bridge that hermeneutical gap and be and be authentic about what you represent for Paul. It's not fair to make him say what he didn't mean. Not for me to do it in my direction, and I hope that I'll be honest and aware enough or made aware by others that I would uh, say, hey, that doesn't fit. You know, I don't know what he meant there, or that goes against it, or I need to modify, just as I hope that my reader or listener will. Um, because like any figure, like yourself, you want to be gotten as right as you can be gotten. That's right. And that's the historical quest, not the ideology, not the propaganda approach, yeah. trying to make everyone persuaded of what everyone has always thought or you think. That's propaganda, and that has its place, but it's not history. That's right. And I'm, trying to do, I'm trying to do history here because I think the payoff for Christian-Jewish relations, but also for getting Christianity uh, to, uh, to understand itself, you know, mm. I think is more beneficial whether I'm right or not. And that there I'm kind of, I'm getting out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think it's beneficial or I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Mark. That, that's, that'll admit to. That's, oh, thank you. And I, I think you are giving a gift to uh, those of us who are Jesus followers. And uh, you know, um, I, I do what I do because I, I want to continue to seek truth and the best that I can, you know, I'm never going to have it perfect, but the uh, the idea that um, I should get settled and stop thinking and stop seeking, uh, yeah, now it just feels like a disservice to what Paul and the people on the ground in the first century really faced. And um, so I, I really appreciate that about your work, Mark. And we're going to have you back as, you know, uh, every volume. We need to have a conversation, of course. We've talked about this already, but um, every volume, I, I want to talk more about Paul. We'll get to get into more of Romans, more of Galatians, Philippians, first Corinthians, you know, there, there's just so much on the textual side that I think people will really appreciate. And so maybe, maybe some of our future conversations, we can anchor in some texts that you've worked through. And, right. um, yeah, Mark, I, I just really appreciate it. Website. I know you have a website. You want to point people towards, uh, first steps to engaging with some of, uh, what you're doing. Sure. Uh, MarkNanos.com. And uh, you can read, um, uh, in fact, you can read some papers that are uh, in these volumes. And uh, you can read reviews, uh, point you to some reviews of my work, and basically uh, uh, lectures and so on, um, getting an idea of what I'm doing. And then uh, there's always a link to the publisher or Amazon or something uh, to, to make a purchase if you like. Um, and I hope you'll consider these volumes. They're, they're small. And they're uh, reasonably priced, and they'll give you uh, a lot to think about. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. That's awesome, Mark. Thank you so much for being with us, and uh, we'll look forward to talking more. And uh, thank you for your voice and your, 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 just, your hospitable posture towards those of us who are, are seeking to integrate Paul's reality with our reality. I, I think your sensitivity there is very pastoral, to use a word. Uh, that comes out of my tradition uh, quite a bit. And uh, I appreciate that. So thank you so much. Thank you. My mentor would be proud of me for one moment. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs>